good afternoon. I'm Peter Kevin, I'm principal here at St George's and I co-chair the South West London system. Can I welcome you back for this afternoon's session? We have six extremely eminent speakers who I won't introduce because in a sense they're introduced in the programme. What we're going to do is we're going to go through their presentations on integrated care, the future. There'd be no questions after each of the presentations because what we want to do is have a discussion and a debate at the end of their presentation. So if you have specific questions for any of the speakers, could you write them down and we'll take them at the end of the presentation. And before I invite Claire Gerardo to come and open this afternoon's session, I think we should just reflect back to what Ray Jones said earlier on this morning about integrated care is not new. There have been very good examples of integrated care since the establishment of the National Health Service and the question is why they haven't been sustainable and what is different now or what should be different now to ensure that that happens for the future. Claire. Thanks, Peter. And, uh, yeah, the first reference I came to integrated care was back in 1640. <laughs> Sorry, can I have my book? Uh, so, and we've already, as the speakers, and we're only going to talk each for, for just about 10 minutes, in fact, slightly less, we've already had our rounds, so I'm hoping these will now be played out in your discussion. Because integrated care, rather like the word love, is used by so many people to mean so many different things. And actually no one really knows what they're talking about, but they feel they do. And I have located 172 definitions of integrated care, some of which require you to have a PhD in Greek to understand what they are. And being a simple person as I am, as a GP, I have my simple definition, which I would love to share with you if that's all right. And I used this definition 20 years ago when I ran a shared care service for substance misuse, which nowadays would be called an integrated care pathway, etc., uh, etc. Et and for me, integrated care is shared working, shared working, multidisciplinary, where people work across their professional boundaries but retain professional autonomy, ideally with a shared electronic record held by the GP and ideally with a shared budget. But I would also add that integrated care, where it works well, should be and must be led by a generalist. And as there are only three generalists left in the health service, the GP, the emergency doctor and the ITU doctor, you can see that most integrated services should be led by a GP. Now, you can ask me the questions afterwards why I believe that, etc., etc. Now, integration or shared working is not about structures. And all the time, people try to create structures. And now we'll talk about values. But it is about shared values. And it is hard to work together with people across different professional groups. It is hard. And yet everybody th implies we just put a group of people in the room and they'll work very well together. And what makes shared working work is not dissimilar from what makes teams work. Communication, co-location, compassion, rolled into one. All the other bits just are add-ons, but if you don't get that, you will not get shared working work. In the next three months, NHS London, of which I'm now the chair of the Transformation Board for Primary Care, big mouthful, which is why the ITV still says ex-chair of the RCGP, because it's easier. Must get a more catchier title than the one they've given me. But over the next few weeks, and launched yesterday, we are going to consult on transforming primary care for the capital, for Londoners. And I want you to know about this because all the time you'll be thinking integration, but actually I thought I want you to stop using the I word. And what we are going to be start thinking of is the first step is to get GPs to start to, 
to start to talk to each other. I work in a practice in, in Tower Hamlets, beautiful, brand new building, beautiful building, two practices, they never speak to each other. Come on, same building. So start to talk, start to share learning, start to share staff, start to share data. Once you've started to do that, the next step is what we're talking about, which is federations, which is much bigger primary care natural communities coming together in legal structures where we start to do some innovative stuff, such as sharing uh, staff, such as streaming patients into acute uh, uh, seven-day working, restoring continuity uh, by having GPs spending longer, starting to use data better, both to inform us about which patients need more enhanced care, but also starting to use more, more modern technology, such as the telephone, e-health, et cetera, et cetera. Once we start doing that and are able then to co-locate or at least to organize community services around the practice, or even for the practices, the federations, to start holding that budget themselves, we will start to get true joint working. And the next step after that is possibly the all singing, all dancing, integrated care organizations, which are now being called all sorts of other things, ACOs, ICOs, MDOs, etc. anything with a no on the end, is a is the flavor of the month but after that we will get to the all singing all dancing integrated care organization which would be merged health and social budgets uh, round a geographical community which is what uh, many of you have probably recognized from the new uh, from from labor's manifesto but also from what uh, the, the the current direction of travel is around integrated care but that is the end point the beginning point is simple Start to, start to communicate with your, with your fellow uh, colleagues. So it's an exciting journey we're working on. The row that I had earlier with, with Peter, which he might pick it up, is I, only, I think GPs are the only ones that can lead multidisciplinary teams. You can all argue about that and say, well, etc. But actually it is because of the family home being based in the GP, because of the, 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 the medical home, we can start to coordinate care around the needs of the patient. And what has happened, ladies and gentlemen, over the last 20 years is we have gone backwards. Because 20 years ago, we had shared care services within our practices. We had diabetic consultants coming to us and running outreach clinics to support us. We had almost virtual clinics before the, the word virtual was even invented. So what we have to do now is to stop thinking structurally, stop organizing things around diagrams on, 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 on pieces of paper and start thinking of the patient and how can we make it better for them through reducing fragmentation and improving continuity. So thank you very much. Um, uh, th uh, thank you everyone for, uh, for listening in, in anticipation of what I'm going to say. Um, I I'm Nav Chan, I'm a, a GP uh, in, uh, in Mitcham which is 1.7 miles away from, 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 this, from this building. Um, and uh, Claire and I have a long his historical association. Our relationship was forged on the streets of South London about 20 years ago. So, so probably I'm not going to be too dissimilar in what I say, although uh, I might say it in a slightly different way. Um, what, what I'd like to do over the next five minutes or so is just to, um, just to highlight, I suspect, some, some, some words or, or, uh, or definitions which perhaps we could look at together in the, in the discussion. Um, I I'd like to start off by saying that integration is not in itself an outcome. Uh, and yet we, we kind of use the word as though it actually is the outcome that we're driving to. The outcome is about improving the health of our population and reducing inequities in the health of that population. That's the outcome that we're trying to, to get to. And integration may in, in some part contribute to that, but actually that in itself is not the outcome that we're driving to. So we should stop looking for structural solutions around integration and get back to what we're here for, which is improving the health and well-being of the populations that we look after. So that's kind of an important construct that I think it would be nice to think through with you. Um, looking forward into five years, so I, did read the, uh, I did read the task. Um, um, I, 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 in, 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 over the next five years, uh, I, would, I would celebrate if the, if the definitions that we use change. If we stop using a language of performance management and, and utilisation and metrics that don't matter to patients and start instead finding words that actually mean something like value and reducing inequity, then that think, I think that would be a success for me. 
And so how do we get into that? And I've been doing a lot of thinking like around this, as I'm sure all of you have. And for me, a, a really important publication published in Canada last year from the Ivy Business School, uh, which, which looked at population-based values, what matters to patients, cost versus value in healthcare systems. Um, a really important paper, and I'll, I'll try and send the link to you if you're interested. Um, what basically that says is that if you, if you look at the values that populations want, three things. One, care across the continuum, and that kind of is, is arguably what we're talking about. But what that means is genuinely thinking about you know, the things that will matter to patients. So for example, having an integrated care record. So if you're an elderly person at home, that the district nurse record and the social care record and the GP record and the hospital record are all aligned and can be visible and are owned by the patient or the family or the carer. That, as you can see, we don't have anything near that, do we? Uh, so, so, so all the time we talk about integration as a process, we're not going to get there. So, so that's one really important construct. The other thing that populations value is tools that help them look after themselves better. Okay? Not tools that are engineered through healthcare systems and creating more ologists and oscopists and, and various specialist teams, but actually tools that genuinely help people look after themselves better. So that's the second thing that comes out of that, that Canadian paper. The third thing is a focus on health and well-being not reactive illness all the time, but actually things that help people live healthy, fulfilled lives. And it would be helpful to think again together what we can do as, as, as professionals and, and, and people working in organisations to support that construct. So all those things, I'm sure you'll agree, require a new set of metrics, don't they? Metrics that matter to patients, populations, families and carers. Not metrics that we can easily manage uh, that we can easily measure and kind of drive the way we construct healthcare systems. So what that requires, I think, is a movement away from competitive institutional kind of stuff, right, to actually, as Claire was saying, collaborative networks. That's what it means. And, and we, we need to think about what are the drivers that will make that happen. So for me, it's very simple. Think of a geography, think of a population, think of the joint strategic needs assessment of that population, and then let's align all the providers who contribute to actually be incentivized to do the right thing. So for me, that requires a single, capitated, integrated care budget across that geography with the right incentives put in place for those providers to work together. And when I talk about providers, I'm not just talking about healthcare providers. I'm talking about mental health, community services, I'm talking about local authority, I'm talking about voluntary and charitable sector organisations, coming together in a unique federated system, but orchestrated, as Claire says, through the values of primary care organised, general practice organised primary care. So that's a really important, for me, next step around the way we construct our system. So all of that requires a workforce that is tuned to the values of patients and populations. We arguably, and again this is arguable, I'm being slightly provocative, we train our doctors and nurses to look after an organ, okay? That's what we do. We train them to look after an organ, a disease, and even we use the word care pathway, but it's a disease-oriented care pathway. That's not what patients, families, carers and communities need so much of. We need a bit of that, don't get me wrong. You know, we need a bit of that, but it's about changing the dial to a different value system in our workforce. So, I'm just going to finish this by talking about something that we're doing in education. Health, I'm, I, in my other role, uh, I'm direct, Director of Education Quality for Health Education South London. The, the question in my mind is, where will we train our future workforce? And how will we help our existing workforce to em embrace these values that I've been talking about? Arguably, the workforce should be trained where the work is happening. So, we know that 90% plus, and I'm sure Claire will quote the figure, of work actually happens outside of hospitals and yet 90% of our training time is spent in hospitals. Does that sound right to you? Okay, so what we then need to do is to create an educational environment in which people can learn appropriately the skills of population-based healthcare. So that requires a, a federated community education provider system made up of GP practices, community pharmacies, care homes, hospices, mental health providers, et cetera, et cetera. But we put some educational governance in there and we, f we, tr we get people to get meaningful experiences of, 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 those, of those things in the community. And I mean community in the broadest sense. So in South London, we've launched an experiment 
we, we're calling it community education provider networks. Education alignment of providers across the geography. We've only just started. But the idea is if we can build this at scale across South London, we can train our future workforce in the settings where they really need to learn the skills of population-based healthcare. So that's for doctors, nurses, physician associates, that's a physician associate table over there. Uh, all of that lot need to spend a meaningful time in, in community settings in an environment which actually means something. So that's, uh, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> point is firstly electronic records for patients held by the GPs secondly that perhaps we should do away with the term primary and secondary and community care and thirdly um, we need to look at the way we train our workforce for the future. So Fiona, do you want to follow that up? That, and now we're moving away perhaps from the more medically focused. I was also asked to um, uh, think about what integrated care meant. Um, I'm speaking as a nurse, a district nurse, and I'm speaking also with a, a, a rather newer hat um, as being the education lead for the Health Innovation Network. So I'm going to try to en encompass um, some of that within in my talk. I'm actually going to um, leave the, um, the views on integrated care to Doris Lessing, who, as you know, died last week. She wrote a very wonderful book, um, or wrote lo lots of very wonderful books, but this is uh, the, from the diaries of Jane Summers. And if I just can read this to you. Our campaign for Annie is everything that is humane and intelligent. There she is, a derelict old woman without friends, some family somewhere, but they don't find her condition they find her condition a burden and a scandal and won't answer her pleas. Her memory going, but not for the distant past, only for what she said five minutes ago. All the habits and supports of a lifetime fraying away around her shifting as she sets her foot down where she expected firm ground to be. And she, sitting in her chair, suddenly surrounded by well-wishing faces who know exactly how to put the world to rights. Is that all of us in this room? Um, I sometimes think it is. And we, have, we do need to think about what the perspective of older people, people with long-term conditions, those are the people who need to receive better integrated care um, is and what they want. So just a little bit of a look at history. What was um, integrated care? What did it look like? Here we have the district nurse. Now I would take exception with Dr Gerardo. I would say actually there's a fourth generalist in the health service and that's a district nurse. If you look at the, read the evidence around district nursing, um, they have been described over the last 20, 30 years as the linchpin in community care but do we have enough of them? Um, the health visitor, um, a stalwart again around um, providing nutrition and hygiene and um, better health care for young people growing up. Um, and um, a very limited resource in, in our system at the moment, the school nurse. Um, actually, this is a picture taken of a knit nurse. We don't have knit nurses anymore, but maybe we will soon with the sort of extent of, of poverty um, which is, is which ta which taking over some aspects of our community's lives. But um, how about nursing? How many nurses, how, you know, what's the community nursing workforce look like now? We, we have a community nursing work for workforce which is riddled with, with titles. District nurses, community nurses, staff nurses in the community, um, community matrons, specialist nurses for this and that and for the other. Um, but um, and we, we know that, um, that, that overall the, there has been an increase in the number of uh, qualified nurses working in the community, but there has, there's been a reduction in the numbers of district nurses. There hasn't been a replacement strategy as they've, they've retired. We're currently, the, currently the workforce is facing a tsunami of retirements and 50% of the current workforce are aged over 50. Um, Small number of district nurses from ethnic minority backgrounds. It's interesting when you look at the sort of the census data around ethnic minorities within London. Um, London has the highest vacancy rate. Um, and we don't know enough about actually what sorts of skills we need 
in the community nursing for workforce in order to deliver integrated care. So some big questions. Um, and this table just shows you what I've just said really, which is um, it, it gives you the stats in terms of the current numbers of, of, of nurses working in the community. Um, and 12% of um, um, the workforce are uh, district nurses, for example. And I talk about nurse, district nurses because they are, they are the people who are um, on the front line in terms of delivering integrated care. Um, and thanks to my colleague Vari Drennan for this work. So um, when I started, I, I asked the question, well, what do <coughs> service users want and think about integrated care? And um, a couple of years ago, I did some work for the NIHR on um, changing um, forms, organisation forms in community and primary care. And we started with asking um, people with long-term conditions about what they thought was optimum in terms of the, the, the professional services that they received. Um, and it's a picture of one of our service user groups. But just to pick out two points um, that, that they felt very passionately about was um, they felt that um, there were big issues for them about how they access services. And that this came up, came up this morning um, from in Ray's talk, actually. And he talked about mm -hmm. access to services. Um, the feeling that um, getting, getting help is now very, very controlled, whereas it, it didn't used to be. And the sense that the sort of gatekeepers to, this, to getting, getting support um, is, is a, a problem. Um, what they wanted from their professional care were, you know, very obvious and very important things. Staff with empathy, people who listened to them, who had a non-judgmental attitude and were, were warm in their, in their interactions. And they also wanted continuity. Um, and, and we know that seeing a whole host of different professionals asking the same question over and over again it is, is not a very good um, contribution to care. So, from my point of view of being a dean, how do we, how do, we do something about this? How do we actually uh, provide education which will help professionals work in a more joined up way? Um, Firstly, I think we need to look at the way in which we train undergraduates. And this is a picture of, a um, um, long time ago actually, one of my students when I was at King's who was doing community placement, and that lady, believe it or not, was um, 100. So we need, to, we need to expose undergraduates, nurses, um, physiotherapists, young doctors, to um, su supporting people out there in their homes. We also need to look at the challenges in, in interprofessional um, work, and that has been raised again, uh, again and again today. Um, um, and we need to move away, I think, from education that's just about formal learning in the, work, in the, in the classroom to learning in place, in place where the care is delivered and with others. Um, now, we do some of that here. This is uh, um, uh, some interprofessional learning in our skills lab. Um, can anyone pick out wh wh which is the medical student? <laughs> um, so why don't we do enough of it? We do, we, um, yeah, um, we're doing some interprofessional learning, but not enough. And that, why is that? I think some of the big issues have been raised already today. Um, difficulties around culture, organisation, power within professional groups. The, the, the issues around leadership and that leadership comes and goes and doesn't stay, stay around long enough to see things through. Um, the difficulties around actually organising learning across cur curriculum which don't talk to each other and where there isn't the time uh, and the, the logistical problems are actually getting students together. And the fact that, and we've got some commissioners in the room, that currently the levers and incentives for doing interprofessional learning a week and it's bit seen as an optional extra so we need to think about how we actually um, make that a bit more real if we really want to see change. Um, I think I'll sk skip over that. So I believe that there's an awful lot to do and we need to get on with it and we need to move fast and um, I just want to leave you with some, um, some thoughts around, and this is a very busy slide, um, how we're thinking about linking education to service improvement in the health innovation network. Um, 
Now, this is, this is, this is a really a proposal for how um, education can be seen as part and parcel of organ, um, a service improvement and service redesign. Um, so, first of all, this, this column here, it's about actually identifying what the need for change is. And starting off with the service change and then reviewing what the educational needs are that will make a difference to that change. Um, and developing along the way, trying to understand what the facilitators and the barriers are to change and making sure that the education is aligned um, to support, support, support the change. Designing bespoke packages. So not expecting education just to be plucked off the shelf, but that it, that it needs to be, whether it's around dementia training, whether it's around um, um, developing uh, staff um, understanding of alcohol prevention, um, that, it, that it needs to be tailored and bespoke. Um, and then being able to evaluate it and, um, and potentially writing it up. So I believe that we're going to do this better as we've said and others have said, we need to work together and where else but in the rowing boat. Thank you. So, the longer term development of the workforce is the purpose. And the panel members will be asked questions on that last slide, so just <laughs> warn you. David. So we're now going to have a view from a commissioner, but also from the social Okay, thank you. Um, uh, David Smith, I'm uh, both the uh, Chief Officer for the Clinical Commissioning Group in uh, Kingston as well as the uh, Director of Adult Social Services. And I would say that until three years ago all of my career was in health and then I took on adult social care and, and what an eye-opener that has been I'll, and I'll come back to that. I think I'm, I shall maintain the, uh, the, the sort of, as one of uh, the other speakers have tried to be a bit controversial and as I will start off with that and saying well actually we talk about the GPs and the nurses, well, what about social care? What about the social workers? Because, and I'll start from the perspective, actually, if we don't get social care, housing, and some of our voluntary services right, actually, the rest of this system is not going to work. And I, why do I say that? Well, the system, the system fails. And, it's quite, and this, earlier this week, I had an email that came through, a complaint, which I won't go into too much detail from, but actually, it's, a, it's a, a, um, uh, an elderly lady, uh, series of health problems, um, came into contact with housing department in Kingston and placed into poor housing, as a result of which she's ended up in Kingston Hospital. She's still there, and we're really struggling to get her out. So the individuals who are very, very complex to manage, actually, my contention is, we are just failing, a, um, and I don't think that is the only case. And I know that because if you look at some of the issues that come through all of our adult safeguarding boards across the boroughs, there are quite a number of these. So the system's failing. Um, that having been said, I think integrated care has to be absolutely part of, the, part of the way we do this. I don't think it's a silver bullet. It's not going to solve, the all, solve all our problems. But I think it is critical and that if we don't do this, then the systems won't work. Um, so Ray this morning, he started off with, he talked about some of the difficulties and I just want to say a little more of that, having, as I say, work in between a council and, uh, and the NHS. And, and I think there's, there's three, thi three things I want to mention. Firstly, around the funding of local authorities, it is going down, it is going down substantially because of the way government grants are affecting, are affecting local authorities. And of course, it, in the old days where councils just shoved up the council tax, actually you can't do that now. You certainly can't do that in the next year because there's London elections. But very, very difficult to, to put money into the council tax. Secondly, and I think this is a key issue for us in CCGs, um, there are a series of people called councillors. They are politicians. And one of our big issues that we've been talking about in Kingston, it's how do our GP clinical leaders and the councillors work together? Because I think that is a critical issue in terms of how do we do that. That is a big challenge because we've just set up clinical commissioning groups and put in a lot of the responsibility. Uh, and now, and if you like, the power shift is with GPs. But actually, at a local level, it is the councillors who are locally democratically elected and they will tell you such. 
So how you get that power shift and how you get councillors working together is really, really important. And I think the third thing to say is if you look culturally, NHS and local government work very differently. It's partly because of that local democracy thing, but it's also, I think, there's so much that comes down in the NHS that I get still from NHS England and others. Actually, within local government, there is far less of that. I was quite surprised when I became the director of adult social services. I didn't have you know, some, someone in, on high telling me this is how to do the job. It, it works very differently. Um, so a couple of, uh, of other things. The Integration Transformation Fund, we've all got to get our heads around. Um, the belief that I take is this is the one, this ought to be the game changer. It ought to be the catalyst for how now we drive some of this integration stuff. Um, the, I think there will be a temptation for a lot of people and a lot of places around to just tick the box. We can all do that. We can easily identify how much money is currently shifted around between health and social care. Uh, we've done a calculation in Kingston that is probably already in excess of the money that's going to shift through the ITF. Actually, we can tick the box. If we do that, we won't change anything. So we're very, very clear that what we're trying to do, we use this now as a way of helping us as a catalyst to dry, drive some of the changes in the system. I think in things of, it is, it is challenging. Um, if you want to know how we, we've done some of this in Kingston, well, you can read the bit I've put in the annual report around our Kingston at Home project. But a couple of things I think has been important. And if we look at some of the outcomes, so what has this really meant? Actually, we have dramatically reduced the number of, of long-term admissions into residential and nursing home, homes in Kingston. We've been able, through a number of, number of things we've done, and some of that is about joining up our health and social care teams. Um, we have taken a view that organisationally we want them in one organisation, so we've moved some of those staff over into your healthcare, who are our community and our social enterprise provider, but we put in a single point of access for professionals to use. Um, but I think the other thing is around two other important things, better use of technology. You know, I think there's been a very poor use around telecare and telehealth things we can do. And the other thing that we've just completed, and I think is really, really important, it's around the home care services. It's the people who are going into everyone's house on a daily basis providing personal care. We've retended all of those on the basis of we wanted higher standards. We've gone down from 25 contractors down to three, and we are holding those three providers around a series of quality standards. If that does not work, then the systems around that individual break down. Um, I think, I, I, just to finish, say, I think in terms of sort of uh, measuring benefits, and particularly the fan, financial ben benefits, we, we stand got our heads head around some of this stuff. And I think it's very c unclear to me how much of the sort of the changes that we've been able to driven are because of, if you like, the integrated working, and how much is due for it to, for example, we've got GPs and clinicians in the hospital working together to redefine pathways, we've got public health programmes, we've got a whole load of stuff. So how much is due to one thing, I don't know. Actually, we know in, in, if you take the totality of that, there is clearly some benefits that we're having. And when we see the stories around certainly where it does work, where we're able to now keep people safely looked after in their homes for longer, then actually there are some real benefits for real people in this. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. So the bit about the local issues and local government and more autonomous than the NHS, despite what the, the intentions were for the reformed NHS. And the very important point about resources and value for money, which really goes on nicely to the sort of the bit that Nav mentioned, which was the health and well-being and the public health Right. Th thank you, Chairman, and thank you very much for the organisers for inviting me here. Um, I've got a few apologies to start with, and then we'll get into the discussion. Um, the first is I'm not going to be controversial. Um, um, Claire and I go back many years. I used to be a GP in this, this area 20 years ago, and um, we, we have a few disagreements, but I'm not, I'm not going to be controversial. Um, the second is to the organisers, really, because I don't know anything about integrated care really. Um, so I'm going to use this, like all good evidence-based people, I'm going to give you a few stories um, and I'm going to 
take out of those stories perhaps some of the issues um, that uh, will be relevant to the discussion. So hopefully in the end, um, I won't be drummed down completely. Um, just three things, really. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty pessimistic about all this. Um, and the reason why I think there is a degree of pessimism has already been alluded to. Um, the NHS is a toxic environment, and it's very fundamental challenges to uh, our, the way we not only provide effective, cost-effective care, but how we actually provide basic compassion. Um, and that is something that we need to address as a society, a society as a whole, but obviously an NHS society. The other key issue is that uh, the system is already creaking and the, the incentive for clinicians, for managers, to actually manage that difficulty is, is disappearing. Um, it is better to actually display how badly you're doing uh, before the papers do it. And examples here, um, I don't know if you saw this, but the BBC is being very helpful now. It's set up an interactive site on the BBC website so that people can actually share their A&E experiences as they're experiencing them, and they'll be tracking it uh, throughout the winter. So immediate feedback from uh, our patients and our users. The other air of pessimism, I suppose, is the financial crisis that's already been alluded to. Uh, so David Nicholson quite recently said, uh, we're facing a 30 billion pound shortfall by the end of the decade. And he's calling for an open and honest debate about the changes it says will need to be made for the services are delivered. So unless the politicians have changed since the last 30, 40 years, then it's going to be up to us and the public to generate that debate. It's not going to emanate from the Department of Health. It's not going to emanate from politicians. And as you know, the, the first NHS director, Bruce Keogh, said, uh, health services must be able to offer better quality for less money. And this is why... I am pessimistic. This is the spending of the NHS uh, since its inception in 1948-49. And it's been inexorably up. And the last decade that we've been practicing and where NICE has been practicing has seen an unprecedented increase in the amount of resource, the amount of money that's been available. So, and that little blip at the end is probably not going to go down, but we all know that inflation within the NHS system is actually much higher than, than the normal system. So anything other than an increase is going to be a, a practical cut in the, in the resources. And we've already heard from uh, colleagues in the local authority that they're taking 30, 40 percent cuts. So if you take 30 or 40 percent from this figure, you're talking about pushing back the, the funding mechanisms 20, 30 years. So, so there is a problem. So I'm just going to give you two anecdotes um, about where I think uh, there are some lessons and um, where I do have experiences in assessing complex interventions. And this is just one case study. This is something I did uh, while I was at St. George's before I went to NICE. Um, and I was evaluating a, a health care system in southern Africa, South Africa. Uh, it was an IBM computerized project, uh, the biggest project af in Africa and they were computerizing all 40 hospitals at the same time in, in the region just south of Botswana and Zimbabwe. Um, and by a long story, which I won't go into, um, I was invited to evaluate. Uh, and not surprisingly, it didn't work. Um, but 70% of IT systems that are evaluated don't work. Um, and I put together what I thought was a checklist, and you can see it on the left. I won't go through it in detail, but. Failure to take into account the social and professional cultures of healthcare organizations and to recognize that education of users and computer staff is an essential precursor. I, if you're introducing a complex system, at least discuss with those who are going to use it why it's there and what it's about. Underestimation of the complexity of routine clinical and managerial processes. Dissonance between the expectations of the commissioner, the producer, and the users of the system. Implementation of systems is often a long process in a sector where managerial change and corporate memory is short. Um, my baby syndrome, we, we're often told that the way to change practice is to get the, the market champion, the leader in. Um, quite often that can lead to, and certainly in areas where they are the only voice, it can actually lead to detrimental effects. 
Um, very difficult to stop putting good money after bad. Um, and then failures of development, developers to look for and learn lessons from the past. This is very specific around a, um, a project in Africa. It was published in 2000, in the BMJ 2003. Um, I did point out in one sentence, uh, it's very interesting to apply this criteria to the NHS IT system. Um, and if you look through it, uh, every box was ticked, um, and we all know the results of the IT system. I think, and I'll come on to it in a minute, I think integrated care is a complex system. We need to treat it as a complex system. Therefore, we need to identify those, some of those issues. The second is where I've spent the last 12 years at NICE, an organization I'm sure you know well. Um, I was there at the beginning, and this is the sort of uh, front page news that we were often faced with when we made those decisions around prioritizing healthcare. Decisions that we thought we were doing on the basis of good evidence uh, and for the benefit of society. Um, pretty, pretty dramatic. The, the one I like best is sentenced to death by NICE. Um, and the reason why that was particularly uh, exciting, that this is the inside front page. The front page was on the Daily Mail. Um, because recently, or just before this, I actually had, there was a letter in the BMJ saying I should be reported to the GMC because of my effect on, on patient care. And so I was interested to see this. This was actually the reason why the Daily Mail came right out with this was because actually they were reporting on a GP. Um, I read the paper and the GP was actually not talking about nice guidance. They were talking about the DH threshold for statins. And that's the sort of issues that you're going to face if you're going to make fundamental changes to the system. And the only way that NICE could survive, I believe, was that it actually had, through all its processes, a set of principles. Scientific rigor, inclusivity, anybody likely to be affected by a decision should be part of that decision-making process. Now it's called co-production. Transparency. Every decision, however disagreeable, however difficult it is, has to be made in an open and transparent way. Independence, challenge. You have to be uh, open to challenge in a public and demonstrable way and obviously keeping things up to date. And again, coming back to previous speakers, um, scientific value will only take you so far. You have to take into account societal values, so-called social values, and NICE, over a period of years, working with its Citizens' Council, developed eight key principles. So any process, any decision-making process, um, needs to, to take those things into account. And, and just one final comment before I, I start winding up. Um, there's a lot said about disinvestment, that, that the healthcare system will survive if you just stop doing what's not worth it and concentrate on what's worth it. Um, during my time I was responsible there, we, we looked at 800. We actually published 800 clinical interventions that should be stopped. But we also costed it. And, and stopping stuff may improve efficiency, but it doesn't necessarily re reduce costs. And, and what the, the new healthcare system, the social care system is, is looking at is not cost effectiveness, it's not value for money, it's looking at cost impact and total cost, and you have to take that into the analysis. So, so why is there room for optimism? And I think it, for the same reason. Um, this is a figure from the OACD showing that the spending, it's not just the UK that's been spending uh, over the years, um, everybody's been spending more. <coughs> and uh, there's no um, surprises that the biggest spender is America that's escalating away. Um, and the expectation is that 20% of its budget, of its national budget, will be spent on health care uh, by the, uh, the end of the decade. Which means that everybody in America would be working one day in five just to pay for their health care system. But this is why I'm optimistic, because money isn't everything. This is taken from the, uh, the Institute of Medicine's figures in the, uh, from, from the states. And it's just showing that the relationship between mortality experience and cost funding of health care is, is not uh, a totally linear relationship. There is a relationship. And you can see where America is. It's spent, basically, I presented this figure, which is American data to Americans, and said that if only they were as efficient as the European system, they would extend life by four years in the United States. So money isn't everything. It is about the way the system has worked. So if, coming back to what I was asked to talk about, 
I think we should treat integrated care not as something that we've known about for 20 years. Uh, we've fiddled about, we've altered. It only we had to go back to 20 years. This is a new system. We, we have to think through a completely different system uh, with new interactions, new incentives, new leaders. It won't happen overnight. We have to do it incrementally, and you have to build evaluation in constant feedback. And I think we actually have to assess not only whether something works, but whether it, it works in relation to its cost. And I think that's where the honest debate has to come back, that we can't do everything, and we, the public need to understand that. And to be accountable for your reasonableness. This is a term taken uh, from uh, work uh, on accountability for reasonableness from uh, an American uh, philosopher and public health um, ethics person um, who said, well, actually, right-minded people, given all these conflicting discussions, these conflicting values, will come out with different conclusions. So the only way you can actually achieve anything is to have the processes in place. And so I come back again to this assessment of process. And my final point is that we actually, uh, we've talked about doctors, we've talked about patients. Ultimately, it's society that is going to be the patients, but they're also the payer of the system. And I think we need to be much closer to understanding what patients and the public want. And so this is uh, a quote from Thomas Jefferson saying, well, I know of no safe depository of the ultimate powers of the society but the people themselves. If we think they are not enlightened enough to exercise their control with a wholesome discretion, the remedy is not to take it from them but to inform their discretion. And I think that means being much more open, having the systems in place to have the public debates, to have the public debates at the beginning of trying to reconfigure a healthcare system, trying to close a hospital, rather than having people at the public meeting trying to sell that the hospital needs to close. Have them at the beginning to say, these are the issues, these are the cost pressures, these are the issues that we need to address, um, and do that through a, a true process of co-production. This is another cartoon um, that I like. This is ultimately, of course, the, the, the priority setting by government determines what is spent on the NHS, um, and all of us should still keep lobbying for the NHS. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think there are some common threads to the things that we've been talking about, and obviously our panel discussion will try and pick those up. But as I said, I come from a, a, a background of leading whole health systems, both as a commissioner and a provider. And I want to, I agree entirely that we've got to think about um, what, what faces us as whole system transformation. But my message is that the evidence suggests that this is derived from small scale, close to the ground, close to the patient working, that then expands. And one of the biggest challenges, we've heard a lot of good examples today, and um, outside of my King's Fund role, I'm um, working with Wandsworth, helping them to do some, um, what I see already as very effective work. And the challenge for us all is, how can we use the, small, the examples, the learning from the small scale examples, but to move at scale and pace? And that is really what's difficult, because we've all got lots of examples. So I'm going to talk a bit about um, some case studies that I've been involved with at the King's Fund, and um, personally as well. And they are, as Claire says, the, the same old, same old. Um, but the reason that we use them is because there are some good lessons. And one of the biggest challenges that we've spoken about a lot uh, today, from all sorts of perspectives, is that we haven't got enough longevity of our systems and our people to be able to actually evaluate over time. So the kind of case studies are the ones that have got a little bit more longevity and can help to lead us in directions. And some of the learning isn't always positive. These aren't the only ones that work, but they are the ones that we can learn from both, both what has worked and what hasn't. And um, Peter talked about pessimism quite a lot, although I was delighted that he talked about optimism. And I would say that the people that can transform a system are the people that are in this room. And it's up to us to create the leadership at whatever level in the service and create the optimism because we have no choice about this. 
If you look at the hard facts of the demographics in this country and in every geography, the number of over 85-year-olds and the number of people with complex long-term conditions, our current model of admitting them and then readmitting them, there is just not the bed capacity. We're already frazzled. It is not going to work. It ha we have to transform this system. And there is enough good evidence on small scale to say that when we do case management properly, when we do MDTs, that it is possible to provide a different kind of care and to take out the duplication that we know exists at the moment. And I personally, maybe this isn't a King's Fund view, but a personal view is we have to do this because actually I think the health service is at stake. We've, we are working in an environment now with competition rules, uh, with different expectations, particularly from a younger generation, where if we don't show as a leadership uh, community that we can transform and make things better for all the bad press that there is, that actually we might say, actually the health service doesn't work anymore, it isn't fit for purpose. And speaking as somebody who's had a sister with lupus who's been in and out of ITU and all sorts of crises, it was bad enough dealing with that situation let alone one where we would have to worry about whether we were had health insurance to cover her care as well. So I would say there is cause for optimism. Our learning can help us. We've got to transform our system. It's a big scale transformation, but it starts from the grassroots and we have the capacity to be able to do it. So um, I'm going to talk first of all about North West London. I was there um, in our leadership capacity as managing director of the acute services, but the integrated care pilot there was very much driven by the GPs and about and primary care. We had some advantages that other places hadn't got, and the two advantages were we got some money from the SHA and locally to um, tender, and we got some management consultants to help us, and that kind of capacity isn't available in all geographies. But it did help us, and so having someone who it wasn't part of an add-on to their day job, to be able to drive this, to invent it, to go out and sell what we uh, delivered was really advantageous for us. And we did have some fancy pictures and slides uh, because what was developed was an, um, some clinical, clinically led uh, groups and a what the whole system might look like and then some fancy diagrams about well, what does that look like from patient flows, how do you do a risk stratification, how does that move into um, multidisciplinary team working and assessment. We were working around complex care of the elderly and diabetic patients. How do you do care coordination? What does that look like? How does reviews of individual patients in a collective situation, how does that move on to looking like what the community and social care services look like on the ground? And the evidence that we worked at um, was that when extra resource, which was the second thing was as an advantage, is that we were working with some extra resource, when that extra resource was um, used, in the main it was spent on social care and not health care in order to keep people in their own homes. Um, so there were lots of lessons that came out of that, um, and it was a major system redesign. It was evidence-based on its uh, care design. There was a quantifiable ambition, and this is one thing that I really want to um, focus on as well. The ambition in North West London when it started was to have one less unscheduled emergency admission per GP per month. And so when people were out selling this, that sounds deliverable. And when you add it up, what, if it was one less per GP per month in a practice of, say, four, that would be 48 a year. And when you look at it across a number of GPs into the pilot, very quickly, if everyone was doing that, the numbers of unscheduled emergency admissions would reduce. And for the small cohorts of patients that the early pilot um, worked with, that did happen. The problem was, when the evaluation was done by Nuffield, was that the capacity that was um, taken out, that was not needed in acute, was filled up by other groups. And that is, has been the huge challenge, that there hasn't been enough of this to happen at scale to create the less pressure on the acute to allow us to take down the beds. Um, but that was when I was there, and I think things have moved on a lot in the last two years. So I'm talking about a system that was designed but that was built around localities um, all developing a new way of working and that being phased and supported. Um, the next example is one which I um, talked 
which I hear a lot about, and I wasn't involved with myself, around uh, Torbay. And again, this is the one that has got the most written up and the most um, improved statistics, if you like. And I work with Peter Colclough, and again, he's working uh, with me and helping to support the change management process in Wandsworth. And he always speaks about the desire. They were in Torbay, they were off all of the scales in terms of over-admitting, of lengths of stay, of use of residential <coughs> homes. And the work that's been happening over the last seven or eight years has meant that they've gone down to the lowest numbers on all of those important scales. And one of the drivers for, um, you know, why we're doing integrated care are about those kinds of things. They are about less duplication and resource use, but fundamentally they're all about uh, improving the patient experience as well. And what they did in Torbay was they were driven fast into a very, let's have less acute care model. How do we do that? And they let their localities develop and they had combined health and social care teams on the ground. And they developed their whole system transferring um, over time. But when they were going along, they very, very quickly, Peter says, uh, recognised that they needed much, much better data and data sharing. And they developed that much better database decision making. And, um, and that over time, they were able to have a much, much better relationship throughout at the highest levels and at the at working levels in their, um, in their health economy. And so they are held out as, um, as ones where uh, so much has changed. The, ki the um, third one I just want to mention is the Aetna Foundation. The King's Fund website, for those of you who want to look at a resource around integrated care, is a fantastic resource very, very easily accessible, and they've got a lot of um, all of the um, courses and uh, programmes that they do, particularly their, uh, their study days, many of them are um, available if you, if you dig down. It's a, fantastic, um, it's a fantastic resource that's available. And the Aetna were, uh, funded a number of case studies, and they reinforced um, uh, quite a lot of the learning. And I just want to talk about, um, very briefly, about some of the learning that came out. They said that there is care coordination is defined in a very different and interpreted in very different ways. Um, there are lots of different clients and so targeted approaches to what's needed. There are different models. There is no one size fits all. Lots of people say, why can't you give us a toolkit that says these are the 10 steps you have to make? And that's because in different places there are so many different starting points that there isn't the time or the capacity or the relevance to have a single toolkit or a single approach. It's about building from what the um, assets are in any geography. So no one size fits all model. Uh, that there is a lot of enthusiasm and willingness to learn and that this language and definitions is very important. Uh, community engagement and particularly the third sector who are of course such, um, such vital deliverers in a community setting are all absolutely um, uh, essential in the very early planning and bringing together. Um, so if those are three very, very simple little case studies, I just want to finish on two points which are not about our traditional models of integrated care. And I hope that this, I find this quite inspiring. inspiring. The first is I came into the health service in 1980 just as this, this whole movement was happening about changing the care of people with mental health problems. I'm sure we've got mental health providers here. And at that time, there were, li there were institutions in big leafy hills, and they had hundreds and hundreds of beds. And over the 1960s, we had a big social liberation movement, and we realised it was really unacceptable as a nation still to just lock people up. Even when they chose to, there was no, they were often choosing it because there was no option. And although it was fraught, we've transformed the system between that point and now to a one which is um, user-led, it's about care planning and ca care coordination. It's delivered by health and social care teams in a community setting where people that need to have mental health services are then um, admitted for acute phases. So I know you're going to say, oh, there are loads and loads of examples where it doesn't work, but we have transformed our, our system of care for a vulnerable group. And my view is that should give us great hope that we can now do this for people with physical as well as or physical only problems. We've got a lot to learn from the way that we manage that transformation for good and not good, because I can also remember in the late 1980s scandals like mid-staffs of people on the streets, people not getting care. But all of that has helped us to learn. 
So that's one example. Another example comes very fundamentally from acute services, and that is around stroke services in London, which again we've all been part of. Just five or so years ago, when that strategy for London was published about specialist services, it was based on the evidence that people that have a stroke, um, if they are given the appropriate care, can live longer. And we had stroke services all about all of our different hospitals. And I never thought it was possible that we would be able to have fewer stroke services in some of our district general hospitals. I thought it would be the end of all the DGHs and that it would be... Um, a, a terrible process but it was evidence based the case for change was made very explicitly there were lots of uh, people that were signed up to it the commissioners spoke as one and that transformation of a care was not without its pain but people are getting better care now and they are living longer and we can quantify it and it's very evidence based so I hope that I've given three examples of what we're talking about, integrated care, to say that there is evidence there that we can build upon, and two examples which are much bigger system redesign ones that we have delivered, and that should be able to shine a light on how we can do this for the future, because I think it's worth it.